it takes innovative thinking, pairing non-traditional experiences or products or processes with what is traditional and seeing if something could work out and having the resiliency to carry it through because what we have right now is not working. The number one issue is that right now, today, would be affordability and how cities are becoming unaffordable all around the world. There's so many new things happening around technology. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, 3D printing are all areas of research that can contribute to housing. We need, just in America, 20 million houses by 2025. The Housing Innovation Lab was created three years ago by Mayor Walsh to help reduce the cost of housing in Boston by testing new strategies for producing housing. It's a house that is put together using uh, just one tool, a hex wrench. One of the things we're trying to do at Fannie Mae is to build a platform where people can test and learn, they can experiment and see what doesn't work and what does work. I know that the best idea is one I haven't even heard of yet, and I know those are the ideas that unleash enormous value in housing and elsewhere. You know, when we started, people told us no one's ever going to get a mortgage on a, on a mobile phone. Uh, and today we're seeing that that's clearly not true. We work with major banks now, and I think five years ago that was unthinkable. That's progress right there. So you have an entire generation expecting an Uber type experience. They don't expect to walk into a Kinko's and fax their bank statements. We've created an airtight, secure platform to allow this data to be transferred. The mortgage business is fundamentally rooted in 50 years ago rules and technologies. And so there's a lot of low hanging fruit here to fix as we go on our mission of trying to make the cost of delivering credit cheaper. If we can do that, then the cost of credit and ultimately the cost of housing gets cheaper. That's the mission. Fannie Mae happens to be one of the most tech forward companies I've actually worked with. They are thinking about things that Silicon Valley are only just sort of starting to get on top of. They're already starting to think about blockchain and the applications. They're already starting to think about how this actually affects accessibility. I work on software that decomposes a design of a house, a 3D shape, into 3,000 parts that are then later cut by CAD CAM or cut by machinery and put together with human labor. With direct manufacturing from computers, you should be able to calculate time, cost, and materials a lot better. For the longest time, um, individuals thought that you could never pair expensive solar panels or new systems in with affordable housing. We've discovered not only is it financially feasible, it's actually enhancing to the bottom line. So financiers, designers, innovators, entrepreneurs, we all have a role to play. The world is what we make it. We're thinking like futurists, looking at the problems that we have today for affordable housing. You know, I always think Nelson Mandela actually, he, he quoted like, the greatest risk is actually working on a problem that's too small. And so I think like for innovation for me means exactly that. Innovation to me means a safer, faster, cheaper, more accessible housing finance system. And if we can deliver that by partnering with innovators around the country, we will have succeeded in our mission. Morning. Wow, students never reply when I say good morning. Uh, as many of you may be aware, parking is a little bit difficult in Cambridge, especially around MIT with so much construction. So uh, we have an oversold uh, audience today. There's a few more seats, but we're expecting standing room at some point. So um, it's been a fantastic turnout. My name is Alan Berger. I'm a professor here in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and I'm also the co-director of the Norman B. Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism. And uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the center and on behalf of MIT. Um, for those of you who, well, I should say, um, I you know usually start this off again with students, please turn off your phones. Uh, and usually I say don't eat celery. Uh, during the event, but if you could please um, just turn remind yourself turn your phones on uh, silent mode For those of you who may be new to the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism uh, Our role at MIT is to be the convener of all things urban within the ecosystem of the Institute 
Our mission is to solve the most complex urban problems. Doing so, uh, we form interdisciplinary teams across the five schools at MIT, uh, knowing that one expert uh, simply is not going to be enough to solve the complexity of our urban challenges. Uh, today's topic, affordable housing, is one such complex topic uh, that needs uh, a lot more investigation, and this hopefully uh, is an event where we can look locally at the Boston issues, uh, but also think of this in the context of the global and even the national affordable housing problem. And I only point that out because as you walked in, you walked through an exhibition uh, that our center uh, recently put on as part of a biennial theme about uh, global affordable housing, or what we call Housing Plus, and what that means. We looked at many locations around the world. I invite you to spend some time down in the lobby looking at the case studies while you're here. And um, some of the videos that are also on the wall are running. They're up and running. So, uh, and if you're interested, please uh, speak to any of the uh, center staff members who are hosting the event outside, or myself, if you happen to catch me out there. Our next biennial theme I wanted to mention is called Equitable Resilience, and I know everyone who's local is now about to jump out of their seats because this is a topic Boston cares deeply about. Uh, what does resilience mean in the sense of equitability for all citizens? We will spend the next two years working on this with faculty across MIT. And uh, the point of this is to really look at uh, what does resilience mean when you're fortifying a city, whether it's for heat or flooding or coastal resilience or social resilience, what does it mean to have equitability for all citizens, not just building flood walls in the wealthiest parts of cities uh, to protect people who have many of their own resources to either move or find safety? Um, if you're interested locally, I know there's a lot of Cambridge folks, uh, there's a lot of other uh, cities here that are represented in the Boston region. If you're interested in getting involved in equitable resilience, this is just starting. Uh, and please, please find me if you'd like to get involved. We want to work with communities locally, and we will, uh, so you could be the first ones in and uh, help us build the program. Now, um, I want to mention just uh, uh, one more thing, which is downstairs represents our international view of affordable housing uh, and some of the work we've done over the last several years. Today, we're really making a huge shift into not just the United States, but here locally in the Boston region. And I'd like to welcome our, uh, the sponsor of today's event, Fannie Mae, to MIT. Uh, they brought a lot of people from Fannie Mae, and they're going to uh, work with us. They worked with us on this program for a number of months, uh, and we think it's a very thoughtful program, and it's well-balanced on a number of topics that we're going to present. Um, we'd also like to extend a warm welcome to all of you from the region who have given up your day. There's a lot going on here, the Mayor's Conference wrapping up. Uh, and those of you who are on the front lines of affordable housing, this is a very difficult, serious uh, deep, deep problem in communities around the region. Uh, today is organized uh, in, a, it's, it's not a typical academic kind of presentation format. We're going to have panel discussions. There'll be a few small videos uh, and a couple of very short presentations, but largely it's a conversational format where you can get involved in also in some of the question and answer sessions. Um, we're going to really just focus in on what does housing and affordable, uh, affordability mean for the Boston area. Um, the first panel is going to look at Boston specifically as we explore what's behind the supply crisis. We all may have our opinions about this, but our experts hope to dive a little bit deeper into this. Later in the morning, we're going to hear about um, technology innovations, advancements in different kinds and forms of technology that will help, hopefully, the affordability issue. It will be um, sort of followed by this future-focused panel. So we have three panels. Uh, we're going to have a few minutes of Q&A after each panel. Uh, and I uh, would ask that you please participate. It always makes an event better 
when we have some audience participation. And if I have to, what I would do in a classroom setting, I would like to prod you, I will ask you, I will just, I'll just jump in and I'll say, please, jump in. Um, our moderators are going to introduce the panelists, so this may be the last time you see me here unless I feel a need to jump in and uh, interrupt to get some more interaction. Um, so again, I wanna thank you, and I'm gonna introduce the keynote in a minute, but first, before I do that, uh, I'd like to um, introduce um, somebody who's gonna also welcome you here. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is there's little breaks in between the panels where we're gonna have five minute vignettes. So it's a little bit less formal than academic setting. Panels, five minute vignette, panel, five minute vignette, where someone's gonna share their research here uh, in a different sort of format. So it'll be a nice sort of give and take. So uh, before I introduce our keynote, I'd like to invite up the president and CEO of Fannie Mae, Tim Myopoulos, who is going to welcome you on behalf of Fannie Mae. Tim. Thank you, Alan. Um, it's great to be back here at MIT. At Fannie Mae, we have a number of relationships uh, with, uh, with MIT, uh, truly a great institution, and it's terrific to, to be here today uh, with you all. Uh, and it's uh, particularly a pleasure to be uh, here sponsoring this program with the Center for Advanced Urbanism. Uh, we're really quite appreciative of all the terrific work that, that you all are doing. At Fannie Mae, we're really dedicated to expanding affordable, sustainable uh, uh, home ownership and rental housing in the United States. And it's truly an exciting time to be in housing in America. Um, there's so much going on in terms of uh, transformation of, of the housing markets and the housing finance system. Uh, we're seeing things like uh, slow, very paper-based pro processes giving way to new digital processes that are really, I think, going to radically change how we go about uh, financing uh, housing in the United States. We have things like automation, artificial intelligence, uh, big data, all these things are changing the way we think about housing and housing finance. At the same time, there are new design principles uh, and techniques and materials around housing itself, including prefabrication, things like 3D printing, um, it was fabulous. I was in Austin a few weeks ago and saw the first permitted 3D printed house in the United States and really remarkable. You can see how the world's gonna change in some very significant and fundamental ways. Our housing markets in the wake of the great financial crisis have become stronger and safer and that's all very good. But all these promising developments are against a backdrop of a very significant challenge uh, that we're seeing in the country. In many American communities, uh, housing affordability has really uh, become a crisis uh, for, for, for many people. It's a crisis that's driven by legal, financial, regulatory, and economic currents that have been in play for quite a long time, but now we're really seeing them manifest themselves. Um, and all of this is taking place within a legacy housing system. We have a system that was really designed to meet the, meet the needs of the, the greatest generation, um, but now is being uh, challenged to meet the needs of generations X and Y and Z. And as we emerge from the financial crisis, for example, mortgages became much safer uh, and more sustainable, um, and yet we have to do more to give greater access to credit to creditworthy borrowers. Today's Borrowers and today's renters come from a much more diverse uh, set of backgrounds, both economically and demographically, uh, more than any other in the history of our country. And many are burdened by things that we haven't seen in the past. There's, they're burdened by student debt. Many of them are working in a gig economy. It's very difficult. They are essentially cobbling together uh, careers for themselves. Technology and innovation are opening up new mortgage and uh, rental options for today's uh, uh, borrowers and renters, but these new products and new think thinking will ring hollow if we don't address the fundamental underlying issue, which is the supply of affordable housing. Uh, the current housing uh, recovery has taken place much more on the high end of the market than on the affordable end. And homes that are affordable and accessible to first-time home buyers have actually diminished 
since the financial crisis rather than increased. And frankly, at this point, close to half of all households uh, are, uh, of all renters uh, in the United States are cost burdened. That is, they spend more than a third of their income on rent and utilities. So affordable housing has really become a, a, a significant challenge uh, in our time. And meeting this challenge will require our best ideas, our best talent, and uh, many, many hands uh, on the job. So it's gonna require private sector moxie and innovation. It's gonna require capital markets that are ready to fuel those innovations. And it's gonna require a policy and regulatory environment that, it, that accepts and welcomes intelligent risk-taking and new ideas. So fortunately, there are representatives of all three of those disciplines here in the room, both in terms of the people who will be on our panels and in our audience, um, and we're really proud at Fannie Mae uh, to share our experiences here, but more fundamentally to listen and learn from all of you uh, to try to help address these issues. We hope that today will lead to a conversation that will uh, uh, help address an issue that really is vital to our country. It's absolutely imperative that we start to develop a national housing policy, but frankly, much of that policy is going to take place at the, at the, at the local level. That's where things really get done. That's where things can really happen. So uh, we look forward uh, to today's conversation. I want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to turn things back to Alan, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I'd like to now introduce the keynote to kick off the morning. Our keynote speaker is Crystal Cornegay. She's currently the executive director of Mass Housing, the independent, uh, it's an independent agency created in 1966 that is charged with providing financing for affordable housing in Massachusetts. Prior to Mass Housing, Crystal served as the undersecretary for housing and community development, uh, where she in Massachusetts, where she increased state capital dollars for affordable housing by 18 percent since 2015, and increased rental subsidies for low-income families by 42 percent. She also launched a collaborative $100 million workforce housing initiative. Uh, and worked to streamline the Community Investment Tax Credit Program. Crystal is a graduate um, of the Achieving Excellence Program at Harvard Kennedy School. I didn't hear any boos, so there's not a lot of them in here. Uh, she has a Bachelor of, Bachelor of Arts from Hunter College, but of course her most important academic achievement is receiving her master's degree in city planning from MIT School of Architecture and Planning. Please join me in welcoming Crystal. All right, I'm gonna like, we're gonna technology here which I might need help with. First of all, let's try to see. There you go. I do need help with the technology. Don't laugh at me, Jared, I hear you. <laughs> oh, great. Anyway, oh, they're for reading, not really distance. You guys started to look really blurry. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming and for having me this morning. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking this morning about how the state has, how the state kind of views what the challenge is in terms of housing affordability and supply, and a little bit about what we've been trying to do to uh, address that. Uh, just want to talk first about mass housing. Uh, I've been there. Um, probably going on four or five months now. Mass Housing is the state's affordable housing bank. Uh, as uh, Alan described, Mass Housing has been around since 1966. And over the past three years alone, we've generated over $1.8 billion in home mortgages and helped 7,700 families 
become homeowners, including 3,000 low-income families purchase, purchasing their first homes, uh, loaned $2.2 billion to developers affordable housing, many of whom are in the room, and preserved the affordability of 3,000 rental units for low-income households. Um, so about uh, two years ago, the governor, when I was undersecretary, the governor asked a bunch of us uh, interdisciplinary folks from uh, ANF, folks from um, DOR, folks from EA, to really look at, do a little study about what did we think the cause of the problem was, because everybody says we have an affordable housing crisis. Um, but then there are those of us who've been doing like straight affordable housing for a long time and it felt like there's been a crisis. And some of what um, we had to do through that process was to educate people who weren't as deeply steeped in the day-to-day -day work as we were. So one of the things we discovered was that supply and demand do matter. And the decades in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you can see we were building about 30,000 units you know, annually through those decades. And now we're just building half as much. And so that decrease over the past three years has really caused a problem in our supply. And that slow production has led to inflated housing prices, as you can see through this map, I mean through this graph, um, as well as created a costly rental market, which none of this stuff anyone in this room is going to be surprised about. The other thing that happens is we live in a, uh, in the state of Massachusetts, we have what we call home rule. And so we have basically 351 zoning rules. Um, every city and town gets to decide how they want to build out, um, if they want to build, and if they do, what that looks like. And a lot of that has led to uh, kind of sprawl. And so when you think about one acre zoning, um, we do this little graphic to understand what that means. The other thing is we realize in Massachusetts that it takes a super majority to change local zoning rules. And Massachusetts is one of, the, one of 10 states in the country and the only state in New England for which that is true, um, as opposed to a simple majority. And when we go around and talk to municipal leaders, we often hear we could have got that project done but for 13 votes at town meeting. Um, and then the real problem, the real thing that I believe raises this to crisis level is because we're not building housing anymore for the middle class. We've now got to this place in which you can make $100,000, $120,000 a year and can't afford a house. Um, and that's a huge problem for our young people, for our families, and even for older folks who are looking to downsize. As you can see, the middle income cost burden has spiked over time, some of which uh, we were just talking about before, uh, gone from levels of 20, 30% to almost 50% in Metro Boston. And because of that, the, the cost burdens are really creating a different kind of city in Boston, moving to a place where we're having you know, really high income housing and really low income housing because it can be subsidized. And then we also had to think about, there was all this debate about, well, who is workforce housing for? What does middle income mean? And that often becomes a challenge when you talk about affordable, right? Um, and the way that uh, salaries are going today, you could be a line cook and a building maintenance worker raising one child and you know, you're know 70% of AMI, uh, area median income, which normally one would be able to at least find a rental unit in the marketplace and be able to afford that. No longer can we see those things. Uh, those things are harder and harder to come by. And because middle income families can't really afford to live near, the, uh, near where they work, we're experiencing huge kind of traffic infrastructure problems. People are on the road longer because if you want to buy a house, you've got to drive till you can afford one. And that's getting further and further away from the employment center. So a couple of things that the administration did. One was about 
making sure that whatever we did, we did in partnership with uh, municipalities. And so the governor did this initiative called Promoting Housing Choice and wanted to really try to think about how could we get to produce 135,000 new housing units by 2025. Um, so we created a package of incentives and rewards, one of which is based on the idea that there are communities doing the things that we want them to do, and that we already have a, um, a host of incentives for communities. And so what we really wanted to do was reward folks who had been doing high production over the past five years and to encourage them to keep doing that and hold that up as, some, as something that communities could strive to. The other thing we realized was there was a lot of technical assistance across the state government, but if you're in a municipality and you don't know exactly what you want, um, you gotta figure out how to do that, and we wanted to create a way in which you could get coordinated access to technical assistance. We didn't feel, we didn't, wa we didn't want you to watch us make the sausage. Right? We just wanted to like serve you sausage. And the final thing um, as part of this initiative, the governor put forth legislation that was basically lowering that supermajority bar to a simple majority. And not for everything, but f for certain good zoning practices. So if you wanted to reduce your parking requirement in your downtown, you could do that by a simple majority instead of um, a supermajority. If you wanted to create a, um, accessory dwelling unit guidelines for your community, you could do that by simple majority, not supermajority, or even not by a special permit. Um, I talked about a bunch of this rewarding local production. The, the uh, communities in blue are all housing choice communities. The governor recently announced we had 67 communities, and that represents almost 80,000 new units of housing that got produced over the past five years. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but we wanted to celebrate it and celebrate the communities that do that. Um, this is about technical assistance and ways in which we wanted to uh, coordinate all of that and really work across the different kinds of agencies uh, that are part of state government delivering this technical assistance so that there would be no wrong front door for a municipality. The other thing we did um, at Mass Housing was we knew that there were folks who, folks, municipalities who could have a plan but really didn't necessarily have the right resources to turn that plan into action. And so we created a program that we call uh, um, Planning for Production which we recently funded 14 projects that promised to deliver more than 4,200 new middle-income housing units over the, the uh, next, new mixed-income housing units, sorry, over the next several years. The other thing we did when we walked around and talked to municipalities was there's all this conversation and fear about really big projects. Uh, people coming into their community, developers coming into their communities, doing two and 300 unit projects. And so we created this program that we call community scale housing, which is really about allowing a local community to put up their money, uh, the state would match that, and that we could get housing production in smaller communities uh, and in rural areas. Uh, and in addition, we did the workforce housing initiative. That's a hundred million dollars of funds that Mass Housing put forth with the goal of creating a thousand new units uh, over, the goal was to do that over four years. We've um, put most of the money on the street in the past two years and are up to about 750 units. Um, we've closed or, or committed 57.5 million of that. Um, we've got some more kind of soft commitments coming. Um, that's 25 projects in 14 cities. 2,300 mixed income units. And really the program is built, modeled after the state's other kind of capital bond programs and serves as a subsidy for communities to allow a different mix in, in uh, their projects. This is just an example of some projects. I won't go through that. They all look great. No, Larry, one of yours is not there. 
<laughs> um, and so the other things that we're gonna be thinking about moving forward in terms of uh, how we continue to address this, one of which is really trying to promote home ownership for young residents and working families, and not just promote home ownership through home ownership products, but really be thinking about how do we um, promote a home ownership development product for this income bracket. Um, that would be very important to us. And we think that instead of really trying to figure out how to subsidize someone who's making, like I said, $100,000 to live in a rental unit, it would be better for all of us if we could figure out how to get them to buy. And that would free up more rental units for, um, and that would help drive price down, maybe. The other thing, um, as we talked about earlier, was we've got to do something around innovations in design and construction. Um, in Massachusetts in particular, we're kind of slow behind the curve in terms of what those innovations are and really trying to think about what is the appropriate role for mass housing um, to kind of bring those things forth and what kinds of risks we should be, we would be willing to take in order to see that happen. And then thinking about senior housing, um, because at the end of the day, it's all about me <laughs> and where am I gonna live? Um, and thinking about senior housing, but not just a senior housing product, but a senior housing product that really does integrate service delivery and pay for that, not necessarily with housing dollars. And as we work with um, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs and the Secretary of HHS, we really feel like there are ways that we could be innovative around um, federal funding programs to make that happen. So I think that's it. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Good morning and happy Monday. My name is John Broderick. I am a mortgage banking director at Eastern Bank and the incoming chair at the Massachusetts Mortgage Bankers Association. And uh, I'm delighted to be here this morning to kick off our first panel on what's behind the housing supply crisis. And I am privileged to be joined by three very distinguished experts who I would like to introduce. Uh, at the far left, uh, your right, is Bill Wheaton. Bill is a member of the MIT faculty and has been since 1972. He helped to develop the field of urban economics by pioneering the theory of how land, location, and housing markets jointly operate. He also specializes in the problems of urban infrastructure and local government finance. He has written numerous, numerous articles in scholarly journals throughout the world and is a co-author of Urban Economics and Real Estate Markets, the first textbook to cover both real estate applications and economics. Bill was the first economist to apply econometric methods to the forecasting of real estate markets and is a principal of Tordo Wheaton Research, a globally recognized real estate consulting firm that works with the real estate industry to better understand the fluctuations and trends of the market. Seated next to Bill is Sony Gupta. Sony is joining the program uh, leadership team at the Boston Foundation as the Director of Neighborhoods and Development and Housing. In this role, she will drive the development, implementation, and evaluation of one of the foundation's strategic priorities addressing the need for affordable homes for the people of Greater Boston with a special focus on affordability and deep affordability. Sony comes to the Boston Foundation from Home Funders, an affordable housing collaborative where she served as executive director since 2011. She received her bachelor's degree in architecture from the Sir JJ College in Architecture in Mumbai, India, and a Master of Science in Architecture Studies from MIT. And seated next to me is Jonathan Lawless. Jonathan is a vice president at Fannie Mae of single family product development and affordable housing. He's responsible for driving innovation in the mortgage industry to expand access to credit and affordable housing across the country, ultimately through, pro through programs designed to benefit renters, home buyers, and the industry. 
Jonathan leads development of test and learn initiatives to address changing market needs, as well as developing other creative solutions to support lenders and servicers so they can better understand their borrowers. So jumping right into it, uh, Bill, there is definitely a housing crisis. There are not enough homes of all sorts and sizes in the greater Boston area. Uh, other parts of the country are experiencing the same type of issues, uh, but maybe not quite to the great extent, same extent, but certainly uh, trends. What do you see from a macro perspective as the key economic drivers of the current shortage of affordable housing? Uh, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I really see this as involving two questions. The first one could be thought of as the problem of housing affordability. And the second question is the problem of affordable housing. So housing affordability is why is San Francisco so expensive relative to Denver and Denver so expensive relative to, say, Detroit? And this is a very big difference. Uh, the same house across these three cities varies by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I call that the problem of housing affordability. The second problem is how do we provide affordable housing for a subsegment of the population that's very young, that's very old, it's infirmed, makes less than the median income. Um, it's a social policy problem, uh, but it's a little different than the first problem. So let me, you know, kind of give you an idea about where economists come out on the problem of housing affordability. We have three well-recognized factors that we can demonstrate uh, statistically, theoretically, uh, explain a huge amount of the difference between, say, San Francisco, Denver, and Detroit. The first one of these is the supply of land. You take each of these metropolitan areas and put a pin in the center of the of the area and draw a 50 mile radius and then ask the question, how much of the area within this 50 miles is buildable land that's vacant? No water, no ledge, no hills, like that. And you find that this, this metric explains a huge amount of the difference in the affordability of one city versus another. Um, it makes a terrifically interesting and clever journal article and economists use this all the time. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, actually, a friend of mine said, well, there was something we could do about it. And if you look at cities 100 and 200 years ago, they filled in land. They increased their supply of land by cutting down hills and filling land. And it is true that if you took the lower half of the San Francisco Bay and cut down some hills and filled it in, you would radically change the supply of land and housing prices in the Bay Area. But that's a very radical <laughs> solution. It was feasible 150 years ago, but not now. The second thing that's very important is the cost of construction. Now here, materials are pretty ubiquitous. Plywood, ste steel. And the real difference is the cost of labor. So carpenters are, in fact, paid almost twice as much in San Francisco as they're paid in Detroit and Denver somewhere in the middle. And it's really interesting because for decades and even centuries, immigr immigrants have been a key provider of workforce to the construction industry. And the construction industry in turn has been a very important venue vehicle by which immigrants got assimilated into the economy. So let's see, that takes us to where we are politically. Uh, and that makes me really pessimistic on the cost side, okay? If we're really going to damp down on immigration, uh, the cost of construction is going to get higher and higher in the coming years. Uh, and the solution is quite obvious. The third factor that is very, very important is what I would call procedural impediments to the development process to permits, to authorizations, to hearings, to inspections. Uh, we have some measures of sort of how long does it take to get a project from you know, start to finish in each of these cities. And it's, it's very important. It lines up exactly with what you would think. And we know from options theory that when you stretch out the development process, you add both to cost and you also add to risk. Because you start a project, 
You don't know if it's gonna, not going to be built for two or three or four years. The market may turn sour, and that risk discourages development. So simply stretching out the development process means it's more difficult to build when you want to build, and that is shown many, many times to decrease the likelihood of development. So in terms of the problem of housing affordability, uh, we've either got to fill in land, uh, change immigration policy, which we don't seem likely to do, or have state governments somehow rein in uh, the process by which local communities slow down, uh, throw up in, an enormous number of hurdles to development. All right, let me go to the second issue, the question of affordable housing. Um, here I think economists again, have two or three very important conclusions that they've developed over the years. The first is that it's not economical to build inexpensive or affordable housing without large subsidies. The Section 8 program, by the time you add it all up, has a huge subsidy to building those units. You have the tenants who have their rent subsidized 20, 30, 40 percent, and then you have the tax subsidy so that brings their ability to pay rent up to the market rate. And then you have the tax subsidy to developers on the back end, making it a lower cost of capital to actually develop these projects. So it is, it is, it's, 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 it's you know, across all these areas, um, this is a real problem. All right, the second problem we have with affordable housing is no jurisdiction wants it, okay? They really don't want it. They may say they want it, but they don't want it, and they don't want it for, from their own perspective, perfectly justifiable fiscal reasons. Local governments in the United States provide a huge number of services, police, fire, uh, water delivery, electricity delivery, lots of roads and bridges, and of course, our whole public school system. And they do that with basically just two sources of revenue, fees and property taxes. And in the United States, local governments can only spend what they can raise. That's not true of Germany or France or any of the EU countries or Japan. We are the only country who says to local governments, you have to sort of eat what you kill or you know, <laughs> spend what you raise. And when you give them that set of instructions, they're naturally going to say, well, the only kind of housing I want in my, to be built in my jurisdiction is, let's see, luxury condos uh, that are absentee owned as second homes, uh, commercial property. These are all cash cows for cities and towns. What's not a cash cow, it's just the opposite, is affordable housing, which will use two, three, some cities say four times as many services as it actually pays in property taxes. Even families are in a such situation that's difficult. In order to, to house a family, you have to put it in, surprise, a McMansion in order for it to generate enough tax revenue to pay for itself. Again, we have a system of states that create a system of local governments in which this is the incentive. And it's going to be very, very difficult to change by policy. Now lastly, the way the market historically has handled the problem of affordable housing is through what we call filtering. You build enough houses in the middle and upper part of the market, and as new houses get built, the other houses kind of move down the quality spectrum, they move to poor locations, and individuals who are, you know, young, old, infirmed, uh, below median in income live in those houses. Now, I'm actually a big proponent of filtering, okay? But filtering only works to the extent that you're building a lot of houses up at the high end or the middle end and letting them filter down. And so that takes us right back to the first problem, which is we have a problem of housing unaffordability because we're not building enough housing. And so to me, that not building enough housing has two implications. It, first of all, makes housing unaffordable for everybody, except the most wealthy of us. And secondly, it's slowing down, particularly, 
the process of filtering, which greatly impacts the people at the sort of lower half of the market who are finding increasingly they can't live in anything without doubling up or tripling up, uh, or what they can afford is sort of almost uninhabitable. So there's no easy answer here, um, although there are a couple of those policy levers. Terrific. Thank you, Bill. It Good. certainly seems like we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> um, next question, kind of piggybacking off of what you described, is, is to uh, Jonathan. And the American homeowners and renters uh, seem to be changing uh, financially, uh, ethnically, demographically. Is our current system ready to handle these changes? Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone, for having me here today. And uh, Bill, that introduction makes me think I'm going to go work on something easier, like world peace or something. It's really a, <laughs> quite, a, quite a challenge you've laid out. Um, you know, I think layered on, on top of what, what Bill mentions uh, and something that Tim mentioned earlier on is that uh, we are a changing country. And the way that demographics are trending uh, makes the housing challenge we're facing a very different one. So not only are we not building enough supply, now, th this may be a temporary situation, but we also have the wrong supply today. And so what I mean by that is 40% you know, of the housing stock in America was built for a traditional nuclear family, a three-bedroom home, white picket fence, perfect for a dog. Uh, but less than 20% of households today are that traditional family. And so uh, you look at the other end, where 28% of households are now single adults, uh, but only 12% of the housing stock is designed for single adults. So adding all of that uh, together, plus this growing preference for the city, uh, is creating a really, really interesting challenge, particularly as baby boomers want to move to the city, millennials want to move to the city, uh, they're living five people to an apartment now. So those demographic shifts, the changes in diversity, the changes in the ages of our country, and sort of the household composition are another layer onto what we have to think about in terms of housing supply and what's going on. And in terms of you know, what's working and how is the housing industry responding, you know, I think Tim mentioned a few things earlier on that are really, really important considerations, right? Uh, this has been an industry that has been very slow to be innovative. And what we're seeing more and more so is now this adoption of test and learn methodology, you know, embracing new technologies and, and recognizing the willingness to change. And we've seen that in processes like taking the $8,000 it costs to originate a single family loan and really trying to peel that back and make it cheaper. And that really helps on the affordable angle that Bill mentioned for those lower income families to be able to get into homes. 8,000 if you're buying a million dollar home in, in Boston doesn't seem like a lot, but for somebody buying a $200,000 home, that upfront cost is a lot. So technology and other things that you're gonna hear about today uh, are really reducing that cost. Um, I think the other thing we've made a lot of progress on is access to credit. Um, we've gotten really thoughtful about what sustainable home ownership means, uh, how we analyze and assess that, how we build technology in the underwriting process to allow people that really are credit worthy and can sustain home ownership to be able to access that financing. But, I mean, all of those things, in light of the fact that we have a supply constrained market, uh, becomes more problematic. And what I mean by that is, uh, I've often been told my role is to do access to credit and affordable housing, but those two things are in some ways in conflict. The more you open up access, the more people can buy, the more you're increasing demand for a dwindling supply of things. So, um, so as we think about where the housing industry is, that's why this question we're talking about today is so critical. Got great access, people can buy homes, but if there's not enough homes, certainly in some markets like Boston, all you're gonna see is home prices go up, which is gonna have the opposite effect that we really wanna do with access to credit, which is find those underserved consumers and help them get into homes. Terrific, thank you. thank you, and certainly, you know, I see that in my activities uh, in mortgage banking, where uh, right now multiple offers on a home are driving up the prices. Uh, we have people who have, you know, perhaps financed a home at three percent, and now uh, the thoughts of moving out of that loan into a rising rate environment is stagnating their uh, willingness to sell, and so just a lot of things which are yeah. compounding as you describe. Now, Sony, you're a little bit on the other end where you're really working with uh, the non-for-profits and, and front line with issues that are you know, very uh, uh, difficult. Homelessness, perhaps, uh, rent, renters trying to afford homes, first-time buyers, uh, education. Tell me, uh, with your work for non-profits, some of the challenges that uh, you might be facing today and, and how you see those playing out. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. 
Uh, I think the environment is the same for nonprofits as it is for everybody here. We're looking at an uh, enormous shortage of housing. Um, uh, the Mass Housing Partnership estimates that we're looking at a 90,000 90, home shortage by the time we get to 2030. And obviously that has an impact on affordable housing um, and housing affordability, all the things um, that we've heard this morning. Um, and also, as Crystal mentioned, of the 351 communities in Massachusetts, each one of them has a different way of zoning, a different way of permitting. Um, and what we're seeing is a, the city of Boston and the housing, the Boston core doing a lot more production than the rest of the state, and that just increases the pressures in the greater Boston area. If you look at the city of Boston's housing plan, uh, Mayor Walsh's plan to build uh, 53,000 units by 2025, they're actually trending ahead of uh, their um, estimated target. So if you look at permits and the number of housing units in the pipeline, those are all higher than what was, what they estimated, they, where they estimated they would be. But if you look at uh, the rest of the greater Boston area, they're actually lagging. Um, so what happens is uh, the nonprofits that are working in the city of Boston and the affordable housing developers who are also in this room, uh, nonprofits and otherwise, are uh, increasingly, uh, struggling with the same issues of land scarcity uh, and uh, housing prices. So for to get to a, a level that's affordable for a middle-income household or an extremely low-income household, you're starting with the same cost for land or for building, and you have to add on multiple subsidies to bring it down to an affordability that works both for median, uh, for median income households, for low-income, and for moderate-income households. And um, the, the challenge is really uh, in, in resources. It's cobbling together a range of public and private resources to create affordability. Um, the nonprofits and the for-profits in the area are extremely uh, innovative and extremely creative. Um, they uh, usually, the list of sources includes a dozen or more um, sources from the public uh, from the federal government and from local government. And uh, we are actually in a state where uh, the public sector has taken this really seriously. Just a couple of weeks ago, the housing bond bill was passed, $1.8 billion of capital subsidy for uh, affordable housing development. We have our own state-funded housing um, subsidy, which is the Massachusetts Rental Voucher Program. And all of these create afford deep affordability and uh, affordability across the spectrum of incomes. But it's really, it's the same struggle. So if, you're, if you have a market that's only producing housing at the upper in income level, so typically any new production is not aimed even at moderate income or um, middle income households. It's aimed at the highest income. And for it to filter down will take decades. It's when the housing becomes substandard that it really becomes affordable to lower income households. So that kind of trickling down will take decades. So for us uh, to be able to meet the demand for affordability, we have to do, we have to act. Um, I think the trickle is, so if you look at what's called um, uh, naturally occurring uh, affordable housing, it's typically the much older stock in the poor neighborhoods of the city. So the Dorchester, Mattapan, Roxbury, uh, where uh, the housing is substandard um, and it's older stock and people are often uh, overcrowded. And for us to make an impact in uh, new production, so the focus on transit-oriented development, for, for, for us to be able to uh, create housing that's affordable across the spectrum for new um, households coming into the city and to the region, uh, we have to make sure that there is a minimum level of affordability and that we're maximizing affordable housing even in new development. Um, I, I know that, uh, again, the, the NIMBY effect is a natural one, but I also want to put out hope that there's a YIMBY movement, yes, in my backyard, uh, where folks are getting together in places like Cambridge and Somerville, Jamaica Plain, Roslindale, 
uh, young people at the local level to say that they want density, they want housing that spans the income levels, and they want environmental stewardship that increases density along uh, transit and uses public resources wisely. Terrific, thank you. So it sounds like <clears throat> we really have a need to go down two tracks, perhaps. Once being, one being the, uh, the, the trickle down, uh, but which may take longer, but perhaps a good long-term solution, and another being immediate need to uh, do something to create affordable housing in, in many of these areas. Uh, Jonathan, are, are you working uh, at Fannie Mae on any types of products or uh, opportunities that might help in that area? Yeah, we're doing a lot right now, obviously very focused on this issue. And I'll just, you know, at a high level, you know, there are, there are ways I think we can address this issue. It's just going to require having a lot of people come together and think about it and work together. Sort of everyone turns their key at once, we can make progress, which is why events like this are really important for us to bring smart people to come together and, and recognize the issue and talk about solutions. But, you know, I will say, you know, number one, figuring out how we make better use of existing space today um, is really critical. And just a, a couple of anecdotes, we'll hear from Nestor Lee later, which has a great solution of using existing empty nest housing. Uh, there are companies like Coabode that partner single moms so that they can go into a home together. Again, you've got this, the stock of housing that's not being used, and you could potentially leverage it a little bit more. Um, you know, yesterday we had a reception, and one of the MIT spinoff startups is doing robotics for furniture. And his claim is he can make a place feel twice the size by having robotics rearrange the furniture with the press of a button, right? Not talking Murphy beds, we have to put the pillows, but really, really automated. And so that's taking advantage of space we have in the cities to make it much more functional uh, and easier to use. Where Fannie Mae can play a big role is in our renovation programs and products by offering finance to allow people to make changes to existing housing to enable some of these new ways of living that can better optimize existing space. I also, you know, the other thing that we have to think about is in a lot of parts of this country, we do have a lot of houses. You know, it's kind of strange. You, you go to Cleveland, they say they're out of housing stock. You drive 10 minutes east of the city and there's just all these big empty homes. And so another thought is how do we bring some of those neighborhoods online? Now it's gonna take some risk and somebody to go in and finance those initial changes, but that's another place where Fannie Mae, I think, can play a big role. Um, hastening new construction, obviously these new techniques in terms of building are really critical. But the industry is just not ready to adopt it. So, um, you know, you say I'm going to 3D print a home, the one that Tim mentioned. He talked to the permitting office and they said, you know, the guy looked at him like a cow staring at a closed gate, right? It was like they have no idea how to handle this new technology. Appraisers are in the same place. And so, where Fannie Mae can sit, we can bring a lot of these people together to help them understand the technology and help advance what the appraisers are doing. Um, you know, another thing I'll say too to Bill's comment about filtering is helping people move up. And so Fannie Mae is looking for ways to facilitate, you know, if there's luxury housing, move people out of their starter homes into the luxury homes. And an example of a company we're partnering with, just talking to initially right now, is a company called Knock, which if anybody's sold a home and bought a home at the same time, you, you know that it's something akin to dental surgery. It's just really uncomfortable and unpleasant. Um, you're worrying about a bid here, you got contingency, it, it's just a nightmare. What they're trying to do is allow, they'll go out and buy the house that you want to buy, fix it up, allow you to move in, and then they'll sell the house that you're selling out of to make that process easier and take advantage of lower realtor fees, lower renovation fees uh, to improve that transaction. So if we can find a way to help them get people out of starter homes into new homes, um, then that could be a way of freeing up uh, smaller housing. Financing on construction is something longer term that Fannie Mae is really looking into. Financing is a big part of the cost that people look at when they're building homes, uh, and we're thinking about that. And then the last thing I'll mention, you know, this, this problem with you know, the regulatory environment, building codes, um, this is one that we struggle with, I think everybody does, which is you know, Fannie Mae as a scale player, it's not like you can change one rule and it has a massive opportunity to change. But I do think that quantifying and recognizing what some of the cost of building codes and zoning are actually doing to cities, um, bringing that information to cities, providing them with resources to see that um, is, is another way that I think Fannie Mae can participate in being part of the solutions. That's terrific, thank you. I see the uh, clock keeper is about to hit the buzzer. And I'm wondering, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience Would that work? Terrific. Uh, if, if we have any, feel free. Yes. Hi, um, I just Microphone is on your way. Oh, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Kudra. I work with Pyatt Associates and our architecture firm down in Milton. Um, and just to put it out to the panel. Uh, I'd like to just 
question the, the, the process here of filtering where we all accept it as um, an acceptable method for creating affordable housing when in fact it's just disgusting. It, it, it's talking about um, deplorable living conditions and places that nobody else wants to live and that we think that's an acceptable way to have more affordable housing come online instead of questioning that in the first place as an acceptable <laughs> living situation. I don't think that's actually how filtering works. Filtering mostly works by carving up large spaces into smaller spaces. So you think about the enormous number of single family units that were carved up uh, 100 years ago into duplexes and triplexes. And it's not necessarily a filtering in the quality dimension, it's a filtering in the square feet dimension. And that's very effective. Um, right now, if you ask brokers the, in the suburbs, the hardest units to sell are 20, 10 to 20, 10 to 30 year old McMansions. It's just developers went overboard and they built volume <laughs> during the 80s and 90s. And nobody wants volume now, they want quality. And so there are these houses out there with large volumes and you sort of look at them and you go, yeah, yeah, sure, I could probably get into that house and carve it up into a three family. But the last time that was done 100 years ago, we didn't have zoning. So you could change a single family into a triplex without ever going before a zoning board. Now, you know, you're going to get slammed if you try that, even though I think there are potentially large number of 30-year-old houses that one might actually carve up into duplexes or triplexes. And that's not a problem of quality with rats or anything like that. That's just a problem of, you know, taking 4,000 or 5,000 square feet in one unit and making two, three, or four 1,000 square foot units. Just uh, one, one other comment related to that too. So when we look at this effect, so um, the average tenure in a home used to bounce between three, maybe five years, and it's jumped up now. The latest estimate I've seen is 10 years. So people are staying in their homes, good homes. They've been maintaining them. And uh, this year we'll probably see about $400 billion spent on renovation. So what's happening is they're staying in these reasonable homes that might have been a one bedroom home or a two bedroom home, and then they're adding an addition to the back or moving, building it up. And so those are things that are just, are, are, are taking literally two and a half million starter homes off the market. So it's not the lowest quality homes, but that, your question's a great one. We have to be cognizant of that. There are a lot of really nice starter homes that are becoming big luxury homes. Terrific work. Uh, I just wanted to add, uh, really, the it's sort of multifamily housing that creates uh, affordability, or has the potential for affordability. And if you look at what's happening, um, again, around uh, around the state, it's I think uh, there are just four communities that permitted multifamily uh, developments in the last five years. I think it was Boston, Cambridge, and a couple of others. Whereas uh, 250 communities in Massachusetts only permitted five units or less. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's not substandard housing. It's when you look at what's being built in the market and the size and the quality for it to, uh, you know, for luxury finishes to become at some point affordable uh, to a middle income household, it's going to take time. So it's not coming down to substandard housing, really. It's, it's sort of over time. Uh, that luxury housing is being pared down to a level where it's no longer attractive at the highest end of the market. But until we build more multifamily housing, I think we're just going to look at um, unaffordability across the spectrum. Well, we could certainly continue this discussion for quite some time, uh, but for now, we're out of time. And uh, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank the three panelists for their willingness to share. Thank you. I'm Noelle Marcus, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Nesterly, um, and I'm here with my partner, Rachel Gore. So Nesterly tackles some of the issues that we're all talking about here today, um, the issue of housing affordability and aging in place with one very simple solution. We pair older households who have extra space with young people who are looking for a place to stay for longer than one month. Um, so we don't have too much time with you right now, so I just want to tell you a quick story. Um, I want you to meet Brenda. 
Brenda lives in Roxbury in Boston, and the, she lives in a beautiful, beautiful townhouse um, that's been in her family since 1946. But it's been a few years since her kids moved out, and with her recent retirement, the strain and cost of caring for this large home all by herself is really starting to wear on her. So she's got an empty nest. Just a few metro stops away, we have Phoebus. He's um, about to start a graduate, a five-month graduate program, actually, at MIT. He's an architecture student. He cares about communities, and he cares about cities. But he's a newcomer to, to the Boston area, and he's really looking for a more meaningful and affordable experience than the campus dorm. So we, we would call Phoebus a good egg. With Nesterly, Phoebus and Brenda connected, and they came to an arrangement where Phoebus was able to secure an affordable room in Brenda's home, and in exchange, he helped out around the house and gardened a couple hours a week. But more than that, as you can see in this picture, Brenda and Phoebus really became friends. Brenda toured him around her neighborhood, showing him her favorite architectural features of of Roxbury, and he cooked her Greek meals. So Brenda and Phoebus, their struggles are not unique. Um, in the United States, as everyone in this room knows, half of all renters are paying an unsustainable portion of their income on rent. And at the same time, our aging population is skyrocketing. By 2035, one out of three households in the US will be headed by someone over the age of 65. And um, the sad fact is that 50%, nearly half, are going to be living alone. So when you ask folks, kind of like Brenda, 90% say they want to stay in their homes and their communities as they age. But they face similar challenges, like fixed and limited incomes, increasing home maintenance costs, and declining social networks. So Noelle and I met just a few buildings away over at MIT's city planning school. We both came here interested in innovative approaches to solving this housing affordability crisis, as do many people in this room. So when our school started a program called Design X, which is a business accelerator specifically focused on innovations in the built environment, we knew that we had to apply. Like any good nerds, we went straight to the data when we started brainstorming. We pulled some really quick numbers, just matching people one person to one bedroom, so no couple sharing a room, no kids sharing a room, and we found that every single night, 54 million bedrooms are sitting empty. As we heard earlier today, this is not a resource that we can leave untapped any longer. Nestorly takes two widely proven models, renting rooms, and on-demand tasking, and seamlessly combines them into an elegant solution for these big problems we're facing. We've been working, thanks to the help of DesignX, uh, during the school year, we laid the foundations of a fantastic business, and within just two weeks of graduating, we signed a formal partnership with the city of Boston. We ran a pilot program with them last fall, it's been a smashing success, and we're now working to scale necessarily across the greater Boston metro and beyond so that we can ensure that more people have access to this elegant solution that increases housing affordability. We're effectively adding new units to the housing stock at no cost to municipalities or the greater public. We're also increasing neighborhood stability, enabling people to stay in their homes even while newcomers come to the neighborhood and we're increasing social connectedness at this time of deep social isolation and division. So how does it work? Users can easily jump on our website at nesterly.io, create profiles, hosts can list their rooms, and we verify everyone with our multi-tiered screening process that keeps the community safe and secure. Guests can then reach out to hosts they find appealing. They can message securely through our interface and then move to phone, Skype, or meet in person to find the right fit for them. At that point, they can use our customizable home sharing agreement to agree to the terms up front, set expectations, and make sure that lines of communication are open to ensure that this is a great experience for everyone. After that, we support with 
ongoing rent payments, customer service, and make sure that everyone has a great experience. So what we're trying to do, um, we're really taking an age-old concept of intergenerational home sharing and bringing it into the digital age. Um, and we are here to build a movement. Um, and as Rachel said, we're not stopping with Boston. We just announced um, our expansion in the Boston region. Um, I was actually at the mayor, U.S. Mayor's Conference yesterday pitching 250 mayors um, um, in downtown Boston. And we really believe that in partnership with cities, we can help ensure that housing affordability and housing security is not just for the privileged, but for everyone. And if we can leave you with one thought, um, besides our story of Brendan and Phoebus, if you leave here today, we want you to, um, to remember this phrase that we cannot build ourselves out of this housing crisis. So thank you very much. Hello, um, my name is Tim Logan. I'm a reporter at the Boston Globe, where I write about housing and economic development and real estate. And we're gonna have an uh, august panel here today talking about essentially how we build and how we build more affordable housing, um, more housing for, for the families of the future. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a few introductions here and then we're gonna go into a brief video and then, and then some Q&A. Um, let's see. I guess I'll start with introductions, sorry. Um, Katie Swenson to the left is um, Vice President of Design and Sustainability at Enterprise Community Partners, one of the leading housing nonprofits in, in the country. Her work investigates how critical design practice can and should promote economic and social equity, environmental sustainability, and healthy communities. Um, to her right is Larry Sass, an Associate Professor of Architecture at MIT. He works a lot on fabrication and design, and um, we'll be doing a brief video in a few minutes. Um, his uh, bio includes the provocative line that he believes that handcrafted, hand-operated construction will soon be a thing of the past, which will be interesting for construction workers. Um, Kyle Corkum is the CEO of L-Star Ventures, uh, which is a, a large planned unit development builder. Uh, they are building Union Point, the former South Weymouth Naval Air Station in suburban Massachusetts, in suburban Boston, 4,000 units. It's about it's the largest housing development underway in Massachusetts today. And they're working um, a lot on smart cities technology as they plan that huge project. And uh, here to my left is Bob Simpson, Vice President of Fannie Mae, Affordable Mission Business, and um, also on the Urban Land Institute's Affordable and Workforce Housing Council. Um, just a couple of words to introduce before we get into the video from Professor Sass. Um, it costs $400,000, give or take, to build a typical apartment here in Greater Boston. It's a lot of money. That drives up the cost of rent, basically, from the start. It costs thousands of dollars more a year to heat that home and to cool it, energy and other built-in costs. You add in parking requirements, you add in zoning rules, um, you add in a lot of, of things that all adds up to, even if you can build the house, which it costs a lot to build the house up front, and then it costs a lot to, for, the, for whoever lives in that house to, to maintain it. And, and so that makes it very hard, even if you have land in this land-constrained, expensive region, to build anything that anybody can afford. Um, so are there things that we can do differently? Are there different ways we can build? Are there different ways we can design? Are there different ways we can plan this housing to bring those costs down and, um, and yeah, make, make, make housing that people can afford, which is, which is, I think, what we're all here to talk about today. Uh, we have these four people are at the forefront of that conversation. And um, whether it's modular housing or fabrication, technological advancement, um, a lot of ideas, and look forward to getting into it. We'll start with, with Professor Sass has a brief video that we can, um, we can do about, about fabrication, which is really on the cutting edge of some of this stuff. Do you want to go ahead? Sure, sure. I'm, this I'm not running it. But oh, you're not running it. Okay. <laughs> homes directly from data. We have all observed how Amazon, BMW, and Apple have used data to design, manufacture, and control the delivery of their products. On the contrary, Modern construction is driven by information. With modern construction, people are expected to interpret and calculate information, manufacture thousands of components, and assemble those components with handheld tools. Let's face it, we continue to work with very old, non-measurable systems of production. 3D printing is just the beginning. The way it works is it starts with a 3D model that is then measured 
data is generated for machining, that data drives manufacturing and assembly of layers, the results of which are a beautiful solid object. Uh, this way of working really gives us a glimpse into the future of new possibilities and how it can relate to the building industry. Our group works differently. We work with large interlocking planar parts, all cut from laser cutters and CNC machines. I had a chance to build a full scale example back in 2008. And since then, we've realized that the possibilities are endless. The system works the same as 3D printing. We start with a model, break that into smaller parts, planes and contours, subdivide that into smaller shapes and develop that into 2D, ready for laser cutting or CNC manufacturing. It's a great and flexible system. It allows us to make, again, just about anything. What's next? I actually think it's pretty simple. We need to put our heads together and build a digital platform that'll prepare us for all the new and exciting technologies to come. So that's a pretty exciting vision. Um, how far down the road is that, do you think? Because we don't see that right now, uh, speaking. Well, I don't think you'll see it for quite some time. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I, it's, it's kind of hard to say, give a uh, timing. Yeah. You know, when you think about um, the two big things, I think you could think about it at MIT that have come from MIT that, have take, that took a while. The first was uh, uh, CAD was invented here in 1962, and that really didn't become a business enterprise until 10, 15 years later. And um, 3D printing was invented here, not the plastic one, but the powder one. And that one also took about 20 years. Uh, so it takes a while for something to go from discovery to actual production. It's, it's a very long process. Um, it seems like this, this conversation around how we build uh, does take a long time. Uh, mo modular multifamily housing, for instance, has been in existence for a long time, 15 or 20 years. We are only now here in Boston beginning to see the first handful of large multifamily buildings getting built with essentially podiums and, and modular units on top of them. I was talking to somebody from Tachi Construction this morning. They're doing a project right now in Charlestown. But there are, um, I, mean, I can count on one hand in the city of Boston. Why, why does it take so long for this, for this field, if you think that's a good thing, I guess, first off, um, why does it take so long for these advancements in building technology to make it into the market? Bob? Sure. I, I, <laughs> You're right here. Yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know, one of the challenges with modular is that it's different, right? And so I think from our perspective as a, as a financing source of multifamily housing, the first thing you want to know is how does, what does the valuation look like, right? So how does it appraise? Uh, and making sure that when the appraiser comes in and looks at a multifamily building that's been built in a, with a modular approach, that they're uh, trained, educated, they understand you know, how that component has been built. Uh, they understand how you know, it's going to stand up over time uh, and making sure that when there is an appraisal, it can be comparable with something that's been stick built. And that takes education, it takes uh, training, it takes time. Uh, and so the market has to get comfortable with it. Uh, we have to get comfortable with resales. We have to get comfortable with the operating performance of the property. And that over time then, I think that becomes uh, much more uh, broadly accepted. You know, we've financed a number of modular buildings in the multifamily space. We think they perform extremely well. Uh, I think every year you're going to see more of them. And as, and as you continue to build that market and you see that there's not really a distinction between, on the performance side, between modular and stick built, I think you'll see more acceptance. That's in the lending and investment community. How about on the, on the policy and permitting side? Um, anybody work with municipalities, you know, zoning rules and things like that? Yeah, we do all the time. And so you've got both the building code, which might be a state level code, and then you have inspections, which are done at the local level, right? And so you need adoption there of, um, I'd say, receptivity to some of these new ideas, right? And so that takes time to make its way through the process as well. Uh, how about um, community acceptance of this sort of thing and the, the design around it, making these sort of different styles of building more amenable to, to the neighbors and frankly, to residents? 
Yeah, I think um, here in Massachusetts, we have actually one of the most um, difficult policy environments. And, um, you know, I recently saw sort of an analysis of cost of construction in terms of time and difficulty of approvals process. And Massachusetts ranked, or Boston ranked, really amongst the worst. And so it's really interesting, um, you know, what are the kind of conditions that we want to put in place to both sort of assure quality, but also understand a little bit who are we building for and how. Uh, we did an analysis, Enterprise did an analysis with the Joint Center for Housing last year on um, asking the question, does the Massachusetts Qualified Allocation Plan, the QAP is the policy document which governs decisions that are made around which projects will, will receive investment from the state subsidy methodology. And, um, and our question was, does the QAP incentivize design excellence or not? And, um, you know, spoiler alert, like not so much, right? There are some measures in there for sustainability features, um, so mostly the unseen sort of elements, um, which are important, absolutely essential. No one disagrees with that. They could do more, um, in fact. But what's interesting is that the decisions about what fits in what gets built is in large part sort of left to a kind of community process. And how then that community process is run or not run can um, put a huge sort of onus on the project. So there's a real um, uh, privileging of the people who are there already, which many would say, fantastic, right? You always want to make sure that um, you know, buildings are kind of fitting into their neighborhood fabric and adding to uh, the, both the beauty and the sort of walkability and all the different features of a neighborhood. But if we're actually trying to say that we want to diversify neighborhoods, we want to do urban infill, we know density is important, we understand that technology and new systems of building are going to be the ways that we're going to get to affordability, then we can't always rely on this sort of sense of, let's just keep doing it the way we've always done it. Let's go with the familiar. Let's let the sort of more parochial vision be the vision that makes the decisions. I think, too, you know, what's going to drive that is how we use data, right, and how we capture data and use it to educate uh, local communities, uh, how we use it to dr drive the design process, right? I mean, if we can quantify that it costs X amount less to build using modular technology, and that that value then is going to get transferred down to the community and to the renters who live in the property and, and the investors, right? Um, then that's something that you can use to educate uh, the local governing board. You can use data around your prospective renters. You know, I, you know, anyone who's ever been in any, everybody here has been to an affordable or a conventional multifamily property, right? And the first thing you see when you walk in the door is a gym, and it's never used, right? We don't really maximize the space we have. No one ever stopped to ask when they were building this property, who's going to use the gym, right? We're starting to ask that question now. We're working with partners who are actually working with builders to go out and survey the prospective renter base, to say, what do you need? How much do you make? What do you want? And what they're finding, in the case of gyms, is nobody wants a gym. They want a bike rack, right? Well, bike racks are a lot cheaper. And you can use that space in a gym to put another unit in that can collect more income, right? You can do other things with it. And so as we look about how we design properties, it's not just about how we build it. Uh, in, in the construction phase. It's about how we put the building together so that we're maximizing space. How are we uh, doing our unit mix to make sure it's matching the needs of the neighborhood? And all of that comes down to data. And if you can quantify the value and you can communicate that, um, I think you can get more broader uh, uh, local acceptance. How do you do that over time, right? You're, you're planning and permitting a building right now that's gonna open in two and a half years. 
And then, but, ten, but that building hopefully lasts for decades. How do, you, how do you make a building that's flexible enough to evolve over time? Or, or a project, as the case may be. Yeah, I, I think one of the other issues is that the buildings we're building now are going to be around as the effects of climate change are starting to hit in the next 20, 30, 50 years. And so um, this kind of mandate over making sure that we're actually sort of future-proofing buildings is a critical piece that, that hasn't necessarily come up today. Um, this idea that the buildings of yesterday, we know that stick construction, stick built framing, uh, balloon framing was invented in 1820. And most of our buildings are typically using that kind of methodology. But the world that we're living in is shifting and has shifted so dramatically. So in fact, these projects that, you know, some of the projects that we're building today, first of all, they were designed five, seven, 10 years ago. They work that way so slowly through the kind of process. But meanwhile, we need to be designing buildings that are going to adapt to climate change, be able to withstand you know, flooding and other issues. And we're learning about that technology. And I think we sort of know in our minds, I, I'm sure Larry and his colleagues can tell us sort of exactly what we should be doing. But this kind of will over um, deciding that we're going to really solve this problem, I think, is really, to me, what's lacking. Yeah, if I could jump in there. Um, so uh, the reason I'm sitting here as a developer of this property called Union Point isn't because I'm trying to promote real estate development, because it's not about that. It started, it's exactly what you're talking about, Katie. Uh, so this situation here in Massachusetts with the scarcity of land sort of overspecified regulatory environment that can drag out a permitting process for years. It's very expensive, very risky, uh, makes it very hard to do innovative things. Um, there was a response at the state level and the local level to do something different with this property that's only 12 miles from the city center of Boston. And, um, and so the intent was to not do things the same way. So it's it's not really Boston, but it's Boston-like in its qualities. It's very urban. And it's not suburbs either, but it's in the suburbs, so it's this ex-urban environment. But what it's really supposed to be is this living laboratory where we explore these things. And so when they asked our company to come attempt this sort of impossible task, you know, we told them that th there were a couple things that were going to have to happen if this had any chance of success. And one was that the overspecified design kind of standard goes away that the best practice is whatever we determine and it just happens, and that we remove years of regulatory hand-wringing and in 28 days you're approved. So the, that market risk question that Professor Wheaton was talking about is eliminated. And it allows us to think in terms of best practices today and implement them in a few months. And it's, that's, a, that's a game changer when you can start thinking that way. And then go beyond. Just don't keep building the same kind of housing faster, but how can we do it differently? How can technology, improve the lives of people living in that housing? How can we be more inclusive with that housing and use that speed? So there are some developers in the room that are building at our property. And we go to them and say, listen, we'll welcome you here, but we want you to make housing for seniors mixed into your market rate housing. We want you to make housing for people with disabilities mixed in so they're assimilated and not segregated. And so this whole, the reason we're here is because the entire place is a big experiment to answer these questions and ask them and get some of them right and get some of them wrong, but be open source about the potential in the hope that maybe more places will allow this kind of development. How does that translate into lower costs, whether it's lower cost of construction or lower cost of occupancy over time? Well, in our case, you remove years of legal and engineering and, uh, and, and the upfront costs that a lot of companies incur, right? And you remove market risk as well. People can hit the bullseye with almost 100% certainty knowing what economic conditions they're going to come out in. Our builders can break ground in under five months from P&S to, to um, construction drawing approval, which is extraordinary. Uh, in Boston, that would be three to five years. So you l eliminate market risk. We're also able to unilaterally decide that we'll lower prices for certain kinds of housing um, to give the, the developers incentives to create more affordable housing, more workforce housing, more inclusive housing, and reward them with lower land prices. 
In Boston in particular, um, there's over the years been, been a lot of debate around union construction and the additional cost that that adds. One of the arguments I hear when people say we should lower the cost of, we should do various things, whether it's permitting or, or more flexibility on, on union rules, then people say, well, the profits are just going to go to the developer. Uh, that's not really going to translate. And they're still going to rent for the most that they can get. And, and they'll pocket the difference. How do, you, how do you counter that argument when we say we should, we should do these advanced technologies to lower the cost of construction, but the market is still very high? Um, how do we see, how do I, the renter, see any benefit from this? Go ahead. Let me just uh, jump in, because it's it, two, two conversations, right? There's one conversation about policy and people and how all of those things happen, and then there's technology, right? right? So cell phones, right? there's the technology behind the cell phone, making sure to it that a signal gets from one place to the other, uh, and then there is who's going to uh, price the cell phone, who's going to deal with the regulations behind it. When it comes to construction and technology around construction, it is an incredibly neglected field. Uh, you have students who graduate from architecture schools or students who graduate from high schools. They understand how uh, computer-aided design works. They understand how laser cutters work. They understand how CNC machines work. Construction workers are still in the, at the state where that's not part of their training. It's not a mandate. So you, you have a bunch of people. I'm talking about really more for uh, single-family wooden houses. Uh, you have a bunch of people who show up with basic tools, for, spend two days setting up to build a small house. I, I, and I don't mean to dominate this, but I, I love riding my bike around Massachusetts, and whenever I see a, constru a construction site, I always ask myself, I wonder how long it's gonna take that crew to get set up with all of their tools before they start hammering anything. And usually that's two or three days that the homeowner is paying. With technology, you should be able to walk in with parts and put the parts together and assemble the parts. And I have to say also, uh, with prefabricated construction, it's still the same stick build indoors. They're still not using new technology. It's still the same crew, but you're heating uh, the environment that they're working in. You're providing nice bathrooms, uh, administrators, a whole bunch of other things that you don't pay for with stick build uh, out, outdoors. So what I'm saying is if you're gonna really talk about technology, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of conversation than talking about regulations. And I think, you know, just from the financing end of it, if you can cut down your construction, your time of construction, right? That's a shorter term construction loan. Yep. Right? So you're going to save, say you save six months on your construction loan. That's great. Let's say if it's on an affordable deal, you have a forward commitment for the permanent loan, right? Well, if you're forward committing for a shorter amount of time, that's going to cost less as well, right? So, so it does impact the cost, and I think, you know, as it relates to affordability, and you know, what's, yeah, I always look at it this way, right? You know, technology doesn't have a conscience, right? It's not supposed to, um, but we do, right? We also understand the sustainability of any development long term is based on the ability of people to actually pay the rent, and you can't have a sustainable development where the majority of people are paying more than fifty percent of the rent of their income for rent for a long period of time. So I think developers, I think policymakers, I think people who finance affordable housing realize that you actually have to, there is a long-term sustainability argument for making sure that we, are, that we are addressing the affordability issue in order for everyone to be in this business for a long period of time. And either we do it now uh, and work with local governments to find ways in which we can make the compliance and monitoring and fee-based portion of this more affordable and simplified or it's going to be done, and it may not be done in, in, a, in a manner that's, that's all that efficient. I mean, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, we're actually partnering with the unions, again, advancing this idea of being sort of a big beta uh, for all kinds of different ideas. And so the Carpenters Union, for example, has been very innovative, very progressive in terms of looking at new ways to build. Now, there may not be where Professor Sass is yet, and we hope that they get there someday soon. but. But like with job site steel, for example, a prefabricated like gauge steel as opposed to wood, which might have you know, been cut in a factory environment for you better quality control and drive some costs down. And then modular units, we're looking at that with them as well. And so these are areas you wouldn't normally think of a carpenter's union you know, uh, uh, moving. But if it leads to better quality, lower pricing, and, um, and it can protect jobs for them at the same time, we found them to be willing partners. Yeah, uh, I'd like to just jump in. Just listening to so much of the conversation earlier today, 
And um, I was trying to sort of toggle, I think, back and forth between some of these large data systems and then my sort of experiences on the ground in communities. And I've been, um, I've been traveling quite a bit lately. So I've been in communities like San Isidro, California, on the border of Tijuana, where we're building a $750 million border control station. It's going to be LEED certified. <laughs> Traffic's backed up to San Diego, right? Affordable housing crisis, no community benefits agreement, right? So where's the will? And when we're talking about cutting costs, it's really about our priorities. It's not necessarily about the money. The money is out there in some form or another. So what's our priority in that situation? I was last week in um, the Mississippi Delta, could be another country, practically, to Boston, um, was there seeing two neighborhoods. Um, we have a program called the Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellowship, and we partnered a fellow um, with an economic development corporation in Greenwood, LaFleur County um, in, in uh, Greenwood, Mississippi. And one of the first neighborhoods that she worked in, actually it was a neighborhood MIT had done some planning work in for years, a neighborhood called Baptist Town. It's very typical southern situation on the other side of the tracks, the ground's lower, it's a little soggy, very poor neighborhood. Um, and after Katrina, some of you are familiar with the Katrina Cottage. Right. right? So architects, new urbanist architects went down and designed these modular uh, cottages, which sat at the airport in Greenwood for, I think, seven years. Because to get them on site involved this kind of ridiculously complex legal and sort of structure to have, you know, the governor of Mississippi change the this and the city and all these things. So anyway, I'm there last week, and all those cottages are now in place. And I got to visit with a homeowner who has lived in that neighborhood her whole life. Um, her name was Dorothy. She's in her 70s. And um, her mortgage payment is, I think, under $200 a month. So perfect. So I sat with her and our Rose Fellow Emily and actually had this discussion about writing a will. Right, So she's now at this place in her life where she's making her mortgage payment. She always pays early because who knows what might happen, she says. And she's at the point where she's ready to look into like, well, what does her life insurance policy say? Does, you know, does she have one? She's not exactly sure. And then how does she write a will so that the property will transfer? Um, I guess what's my point in bringing these things up? I think that... Um, I think that there's absolutely technologies that are available. There's no question about it. The Katrina Cottage, in a way, was an innovation at the time. It was saying FEMA trailers are a disaster and we know it. How do we do a better version of that? But when that um, technology solution then sits at the airport for seven years because of this kind of political and regulatory environment, how do we break through that? So in our case, it's, you know, Emily Rausch Elliott down there duking it out every day with the city, the county, the state, trying to put these pieces together and be one of those kind of connectors. And what you see is that in the process of that, she and her husband, who now have a firm called Delta Design Build, actually started an economic development organization that was basically hiring local people to do the site work, the, the local, you know, to do, um, they have a gardening and uh, landscaping business now. They have a, they were building the on-site pieces. So I think we should be able to sort of figure this stuff out, you know. And I think that while we're looking at these kind of macro trends, which I heard the data, and, and I've been the person on the panel sometimes who's talking about those macro trends. But I think we also have to recognize that, you know, these kinds of solutions that Kyle's talking about. Like, we can figure this out. We have all the pieces. But if we're building $750 million lead certified 
border control stations, you know, where are our priorities and how are we sort of understanding that this is not an academic discussion. This is, you know, a, 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 a critical, relevant, timely um, situation that we have to kind of dig in and make sure that we're solving. Yeah. One thing that strikes me in writing about housing is, is this is one of the biggest challenges facing our country, right, at a national level, whether it's in affluent, high-cost cities like Boston or low-income communities like the Gulf Coast of Louisiana. I used to work in St. Louis. Huge affordable housing crisis in St. Louis, which has really lot, very inexpensive housing, but there's no affordable housing that gets built there. And, and the solutions are being done at a local level in different towns, in different cities. You have different people like Mayor Walsh in Boston who are sincerely trying to tackle this. But it's always, like you said, at a sort of an individual community level basis. How do you scale, or, or what you're doing in South Weymouth, right? That's an individual project. It's great, but it's, it's only so big. Yeah, so How we- scale it nationally? Yeah, so- on the agenda. We're, we're not trying to be the answer for everything right. or even suggest that anything we're doing applies anywhere else. But when you kind of care about asking the right questions and the outcomes, sometimes you make these little discoveries. So a, an apartment developer, a market rate apartment developer, does not have to create affordable housing in our project. They can just do market rate housing. But we ask them to do some workforce housing, and that's great. Uh, and, and they're usually pretty happy to do that, especially if we price it appropriately for them. But there's a missed opportunity. They have, under the federal building code, they have to build some units that are handicap accessible. But there's this concept called visitability. There's a, um, an advocate here in Boston named John Kelly. He's a wheelchair um, access advocate. And he says, you know, imagine a world in which you can go from your house to someone else's house. You can go visit everyone. And there isn't a curb. There isn't a doorstop that prevents you, you know, a, a, a brownstone that your friend lives in the second floor. You can actually go up and see him, right? So, you know, he's challenged us to think of how to build a city where everyone can go visit everyone else. And so when you talk to the developers of the market rate housing or the workforce housing, whatever, nobody's creating a shared living unit. And it's so desperately needed. We've got people living in group homes that want to be independent. They want to be part of society. And it's just this little disconnect between the folks that do the same thing every time. And they're actually very willing to, to make slight adjustments to open up this opportunity because there are 4.9 million people with disabilities who get their you know, housing subsidy through SSI who don't, can't afford housing, right? And so this problem could be solved by just connecting those two worlds. You know? It's not a subsidy program. It's just designing the building a little bit differently so that you could have a caregiver and two people with disabilities in a unit. And, it's, and so we're finding open receptivity to it and the hope that they'll do this in more places once they learn how easy it is how beneficial it is to our community. So I don't know if anyone will do it again after they leave here, but the hope is that maybe some will, you know. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges to bring anything to scale is, and we've found this at Fannie Mae because this is, you know, what yeah, you we do, do, right? right. Do you know, our, our, our job is to go out and attract capital from all over the world and put it to work for affordable housing, whether it's single family or multifamily, right? But in order to do that, you need scale and you need standardization. And those are two things that you don't often think about when you're innovating, right? Um, you know, I, I always say that, you know, if, if it's cool and it's interesting and everybody wants to talk about it, that's innovation. And if it's boring and repetitive and puts everybody to sleep, that's success, Ooh. right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's the challenge, right? Because you have to take innovation and make it boring. Uh, when we started our green financing program seven years ago, uh, nobody had ever built a product that gave an incentive for borrowers to save energy or water or provided additional proceeds for them to do that, right? Um, we were yelled at. We had borrowers call us up and tell us we were crazy. Um, we probably were. We kept doing it. Over the first four years, I think we had four failed products. We closed two loans, right? We kept at it. Right? This was innovative. We were doing innovative things, but it wasn't to scale. Uh, today, we're the largest global issuer of green bonds in the world. Uh, we've done over $30 billion worth of business. And what we've learned is that you have to take things, take that innovation, and find ways to simplify it. Right? We, collect, um, we don't collect infinite amounts of data. We, don't, we collect 10. Right? You have to save energy here, save water here. Um, we took um, this uh, radical idea that you can save 20% water 
on every multifamily property in the country. You know how you do it? It's not really innovative. It's replacing your toilets, right? That saves water, so let's go do it. And let's do it as many times as we possibly can. Uh, and so you have to make it repetitive, you have to make it boring, and you have to also enforce some standardization and be willing to, to, to make that trade-off. You have to make sure that you're training people along the way and you're treating cost reduction as an, part of an ecosystem. Right? So the biggest challenge we had was making sure the folks that were doing the green energy audits, that they were all on the same page with each other and that they all understood what we wanted and that they can all look at multifamily properties in the exact same way everywhere across the country. If you want to get modular off the ground, you have to make sure that appraisers are doing the same thing. Right? But, but then again, if you, if you um, want to talk about boring and repetitive, right? Like, Kyle, do you know how much time it takes for, you probably are going to install thousands of toilets in those units. Not me, but. Or possibly <laughs> you. It could be. depends upon how bad things get. Yeah. Do you know how long it takes to install each toilet? Do you long, know how long it takes for them to take it out of the package, uh, uh, screw it down, put in that little wax ring, and walk away? That's data that you don't have. Right. So when you move on to the next property, you have no idea uh, that this company is going to use a better, faster, cheaper method. Right. And if you think about how cars are made and you look at design for manufacturing, they know those numbers. That's right. You know how long it takes to put a small that's screw right. or clip onto each part and they can optimize how that works. There's a lot of data that's missing. Yes. We, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And right now, I'm certain whatever price they gave you to build, you could probably double it, right? Because that's the way it works here at MIT, that's right? Yeah. <laughs> Whenever we build something here, it's always, whatever the estimate is, it's always double after it's done. Right. And the time is always doubled. So there are a lot of data points we're missing. You know, it's There's interesting. a lot we don't know. In, in the home building world, they say that the national home builders, who actually comprise a minority of all the, the homes that get built, are closer to knowing. They, they know how many board feet, how many nails, that kind of thing. And they say that the local builders, the small guys, don't know if they even made a profit until the, they closed the house, right? And they have no clue because they're not standardized in any way. So the whole industry could benefit from improvements in these areas. There's no question that it should be viewed more as a manufacturing operational kind of thing as opposed to this art, artisanal kind of industry. And also, are you, are you profiting because you're charging more to install that toilet than a local right. contractor? Right. right, right. I know that's the way it works here. Right, a wall costs a lot more to install at MIT, but we just jack up the prices because there are other things going on. Sure. So how do we get that data? At a, you know, it's one thing, like you said, with a large tract builder that's building a giant subdivision, they can standardize to a degree, but how do you get that data? Well, you have to see it as, as being important. Right. You have to see it as being part of the cost. Yeah. And you also have to see it as a developer as, I want to increase my profit. It's, it's really a money thing. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. And you also have to develop technologies for measuring. Right now, we, we don't measure stuff. We don't know how long it takes somebody to deliver parts and move, picking up little tools. Uh, you can imagine if somebody made a car the way that we make a small house with, uh, from Home Depot, yeah. Yeah. It would, the car would cost a lot more. Oh, yeah. Well, where, so uh, there's one area where, where this applies absolutely, and that is um, every single building in our community under normal rules would have their own heating and cooling, and they may or may not have solar or geothermal or wind, you know, sustainably generated energy. But um, you know, if we're striving for, you know, carbon neutrality in, in the city, how do you do it if you don't control all those systems? You think about the inefficiency and then the duplication of all of those for redundancy and everything. And it's huge waste, waste of time and money. And so what we're trying to convince people to do is trust us and let us build a centralized system where innovation can be spread universally. And, um, but we don't have great data on what the savings are. We know it'll be cheaper. We just don't know quite how much yet because it isn't done on a wide enough scale yet to be able to measure, right? But to our astonishment, virtually everyone has agreed to do it. Uh, but they're going into it knowing that it's kind of an unknown, you know? And so there's a spirit of innovation there, but they have to be encouraged and, and have be reassured and backstopped, but we're finding receptivity to that. And we're hoping that the data is really supportive of more of these centralized systems, you know, but we don't know. I, th I think as, as we think about it, you know, we want to be able to attract more investors to affordable housing. And one of the untapped opportunities that we see is uh, the 
the willingness of social impact investors all over the world uh, to put money into commercial real estate in the United States. And what we're finding is they're asking, you know, so we're out, uh, we have a team out in Europe today uh, selling green bonds. The question that social impact investors ask is, is it reducing cost? Is it increasing affordability? Does it improve local communities and neighborhoods? And does it reduce your environmental footprint, right? So of those four data points, we can prove one, right? We can prove that it's reducing the environmental footprint. We know that with our, our green financing program that on average, a property saves $50,000 a year in annual operating expenses when they go green, right? The tenant saves about $130 a year in utility costs, right? We know that. Um, a lot of those are projections. Next year, we'll actually have actual data, right? And we're going to put that through to our investors so that they can see that. We don't really know what the, we can't quantify the value of affordability, which is something that I think we need to be thinking about in terms of innovation. You know, how do we quantify the benefit of someone paying 30% of their income for rent versus 50% of their income for rent? And I can tell you that extra 20% you're not spending on your rent, you're more than likely going to spend in your local neighborhood, right? So there's an impact to your local tax base. If we can quantify that data, you know, we can help make sure that local communities understand that when they do a property tax abatement for an affordable property, there's actually a payback and maybe it's a net positive. We don't know, but maybe it is. Um, we know if we can reduce costs, how much of that translates back to the investor, which in, in turn incents more investment, how much of that accrues back to the renter, um, when you design a property, how does it extend the useful life? How does it improve the health and well-being of the person that lives there? All of these are data points that we can actually quantify. But in order for us to take that back and show it to our investors, we want four or five data points for each one. We don't want a million. We don't want one for every community because every community is different. Every community isn't different, right? We want five or six data points that we can go back and say, this is what it does. Yeah, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to tell the right story, or the or the most accurate story. Bob, I um, actually met with your sustainable communities team last week on Thursday in D.C. and um, and like many groups, both Enterprise and Fannie Mae are really trying to look at housing as one piece of a larger ecosystem. Of course, like we all know, when you choose where you want to live, you're choosing like where your kids are going to go to school, how are you going to get to work, where are you going to shop. Like these things are not unique to me, right? These are universal premises. And um, so we have developed a, 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 a framework that's called Opportunity 360. You can go online, you can enter sort of a zip code, and you can understand how, how a neighborhood is essentially sort of stacking up in terms of these sort of elements. How is it transit friendly? Is it food and health friendly? Is it sort of providing the educational or access to jobs and opportunities? So I think we're starting to develop some of these systems. I think this question, though, around um, larger industry adoption and cooperation is actually one of the things that is so critical right now. And um, you know, even the term affordable housing is tricky, right? We've learned that. Like, we actually know that. We did a study with a group called Frameworks that was sort of analyzing sort of public response and opinion to words, including the term affordable housing, which we all use. And those of us who are sort of housers are really invested in the idea of affordable housing. For me, it's all good. It's only good. But I think that housing and real estate crosses this kind of line between sort of self-determination and public policy. So like, well, I bought my house, and I'm paying my mortgage, and I'm going to sell my house for X. It's like a, it's a consumer mentality around a sort of you know, transaction and investment that we feel very personally. I've done well. And there's a sense that housing is like that other thing, that project, that apartment building. It's not necessarily equated with my home and where I live. So I think as an industry, number one, we actually need to get smarter around understanding 
how to align our efforts around language, around um, a kind of perception, around really being clear about what we're, what we're talking about, which is, I think, at the core, it's basically sort of providing, um, you know, ensuring that everyone in our communities has, you know, a high quality, safe and stable home where they can raise their kids and get on with their lives, right? It's not sort of, it's not, it's not a product. It's not, you know, it's sort of a, a very basic goal. But I think the industry could do a lot of work around aligning around some of these word choices, going on a bit more of maybe a marketing campaign. You know, housing wasn't a policy issue in the last presidential election. Didn't even appear. You hear it at, I know the mayors are talking about it. You know, obviously the mayors are closer to the ground. At the mayor's conference, they're talking about it. But it's not a national issue. It's not perceived as a national policy issue. And I think it's incumbent on sort of the, the diverse and aligned professionals who care about housing everybody, including the most vulnerable people in our communities, to really align and kind of coalesce, you know, seek and provide the data points and sort of move, move the discussion into a next round. Well, that sounds like a great place to throw it open to Q&A. We've got five or 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone moving around back there. There it is. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is for Mr. Kyle Corkum. You know, in, I don't agree with you, by the way, Katie, about afford uh, affordability issues. Affordability is a problem. And if it's not being brought up nationally, it's because the poor don't have a voice. But let me ask you, Mr. Corkum, in terms of your construction practices, why can't you allow greater threat equity participation? You know, like the IKEA model. You have the package, you bring it in, you install some of the things yourself. That's the first question. Sure. Second question is for Mr. Larry Sass. I feel that we, I'm an architect, <clears throat> that we as architects are useless in terms of innovation because we don't understand engineering. In order to become in innovative, we have to be equally ingenious also. So two questions. Was mine a question or a statement? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good statement, though. Yeah, so sweat equity is interesting. We don't actually build the units. We're the land developer. Uh, but we're trying to foster innovation. And we're, we're actually trying to create affordably priced housing, using playing that game, the nuanced game of language. Uh, that looks exactly like market rate housing, and then mix it in as well. So it's tricky. Um, we can push the builders only so far. Sometimes the lenders have requirements that things be done. So this is all brand new. Everything's being built from scratch. We're trying to break some of the models. But in some cases, for it to be most effective, we have to work with the system and look for you know, subtle innovations in that system. I love the sweat equity model, though. I think it's a great idea. Katie, I, I would just ask you to expand your idea regarding affordability. And you were referencing uh, families raising young children. Um, one of the failures, I think, in the discussion about affordability is people who own a home and want to downsize and need to find an affordable place to go so that they can stay in their community, continue to have roots in the community, and that is a very significant issue in the Boston metropolitan area. Yeah, I, I loved the Nesterly um, idea earlier today. I have a 22-year-old um, who's not my own living with me this year. Um, it's super affordable for her, and it's awesome for us because she provides just another perspective and, and joy in our household, which is really nice. Um, so I think some of these ideas about actually leveraging our, the space we have more effectively are really important. Um, you know, here in Boston, we're so lucky to have Amy Schechtman and Jewish Community Housing for the Elderly as one of like the leading thinkers on um, uh, what, she, what Amy is very clear on calling aging in community as opposed to aging in place. And this idea that we do need to sort of be providing a kind of more communal, dense, um, smaller environment to support 
um, seniors as they age and make sure that we're building in the kind of um, social design and physical design features that are going to keep people healthier over the long term. Um, she's determined with many, many others to kind of crack this nut about investing in, um, in high quality housing as opposed to investing in health care. So she's sort of making the, the, the bet that we could keep people out of assisted living almost entirely, which again, when you look at sort of the value streams about where we're spending our investment, um, how do we invest proactively into the kind of solutions that are providing like these quality of life and health outcomes as opposed to investing in sort of a patient-centered healthcare model. Um, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that that's, that sounds, that we've, we've covered the whole lifespan from building the housing to, to um, the end. Um, and it's about the end. We could go on for probably another hour here. I thought one, I'm, I'm one be point. quick. Sure. Um, because I was thinking about the gentleman who talked about architects uh, participating in the process. And the one thing that you learn about in design school is discovery. You learn how to discover new ideas. You learn how to just uh, connect things together. And if you think about affordability, if you think about your phone, your phone has replaced a host of things that we, the cassette player, television set, there are a bunch of things that are replaced by the phone, right? If you think about it in terms of innovation around the home, there are a lot of things that we're just not thinking about, turning doors and windows into heaters, we get rid of the furnace, uh, using wireless electricity, which is an up and coming technology, get rid of all of the outlets that are buried in our walls and buried in our ceilings. The wiring. Right, if you think about those costs going away, shimming doors and windows, right. shimming thousands of doors and windows, all of that stuff, all of those costs add up. And uh, if you really want to think about affordability, you really just have to think about how technology can replace things the way that the phone has. It's more than just um, looking at it, but it's a mindset. It's the way you think about uh, how you want to transform a home. Yeah. Well, it's a lot to think about. Um, applause for our panel. It's a great conversation. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. It's a pleasure to be closing um, and to have uh, learned a lot about affordability and about housing, and I will talk about that and also introduce um, my view on how um, prefabrication and off-site technology, something that was introduced in the last panel, can also help to actually uh, help to make affordability and, and housing meet. And I will also talk about architecture with capital A and not just about construction. But uh, basically my, my team in Samda Studio and myself, we've been for many years designing, building, testing with a wide range of construction technologies and delivery methods. Certainly introducing prefabrication um, uh, as a way to, as was addressed uh, earlier on, improve quality, improve the control of time um, and, uh, and the control of risk in the sites of construction and the control of cost in the construction. And uh, we have uh, tested these with precast concrete, with uh, steel, and uh, also discovered some of the limitations of prefabrication that have to do with moving heavy parts um, around. So in MIT, we um, continued a, a research that has to do with lightness and with uh, introducing uh, new materials and, and testing the structures that reduce the weight of the, of the structures that we build. And we developed, as you can see in the top, some, um, some structures that work with uh, compression and uh, just use foam, which is 98% air, to, to test some, uh, a very small housing unit. And then in the lower part, mixing foams with uh, other materials like steel to enhance the performance like we learned in, in, with Bristol's concrete. So having tested, uh, having acquired certain experience uh, building and working with different uh, technologies, we decided to um, give a try and, and develop a solution 
that uh, for the housing market in the US that would bring into the equation many of the things that we had learned about materials and how those materials can, can come together in an easy way that will lower the cost of construction and therefore be able to, to build more affordably. And uh, we became our own um, guinea pigs and we decided to build our own homes. We are researchers, but we are architects and builders. We are very proactive and because we need solutions urgently, we think it is worth uh, actually prototyping and, and getting the, the ideas built uh, as quick as possible. So we took this experiment, we bought this uh, uh, one-story garage in Brookline, and we decided to build uh, or, or expand our home on top of it. And it had to be very light uh, because we didn't want to spend extra money in reinforcing the foundations, so we designed a kit of parts. These parts had to be as big as possible to minimize the time of construction on the site, minimize also the, um, the, the hassle in the neighborhood, and, uh, and also minimize the cost of the assembly because, um, as you know, labor in the U.S. is super expensive. So one of the things that um, we like about prefabrication, we are aware that there's a lot of prejudice and a lot of... Um, misunderstanding of what prefabrication can imply in the construction sector, but the fact is that for us, it allows us to bring construction uh, logics into the design logic. And this means eliminating uncertainties and uh, being able to fix decisions very early on in the process. So we designed the house, we designed all the assembly uh, process, and when it got the time of looking at how we were going to pay for this, we discovered that it was actually very unaffordable to build it in the US. Um, so we decided to, um, to build it in Spain where we had our team of, uh, of uh, architects and uh, engineers and, uh, and we set up a, a factory, a small uh, factory space where we continue to develop the technology as we were building the parts of the house. When you look at how uh, a prefabrication and how things come to the site, you have to bear in mind, of course, uh, the travel and how these parts are going to fit in the trucks or containers that actually need to uh, deliver them on the site. The technology that um, we developed is actually is nothing out of this world. It's using off-the-shelf materials, widely available, pretty cheap, but assembled in a, all the intelligence is placed in how these materials come together, how they resolve the structure, how they resolve the enclosure and the thermal performance, and how the mechanicals are placed. So all the basics, uh, actually all the fundamental aspects of the house are integrated in this technology that when it comes to the site, because it has been highly pre-engineered, um, everything fits pretty smoothly. And again, this was an experiment. This was our prototype. It could have not worked so smoothly, but in fact, it did. So um, as much as we thought also about the technology, we were thinking about the architecture and how uh, you know, what contemporary architecture means uh, today and means in our cities and how can we build affordably without it looking cheap or without it looking old. And uh, we were also thinking about space and about flexibility and some of the things that were discussed previously, how, what are the family structures today, how people live, what kind of spaces they need. So, I mean, this is our a home that is essentially thought for us, we just needed a big space. But uh, it is a home that has made us think a lot on how, you know, we sometimes, when, when we do development, we sometimes place the attention in aspects that are not really adding value to what is built. So our effort is really to add value to those things that are meaningful, to those aspects of the home that will create the resilience 
and that will allow the home to change over time as uh, needed. So, as I said, this house is a laboratory. It was an experiment that was meant to help us open up discussions with other stakeholders to be able to say, hey, we've proven our concept and, and we're not just talking about you know, a nice idea of a researcher uh, at MIT, but this really can be built. And uh, so we moved forward to create um, Woho World Homes, uh, connecting with a courageous uh, developer and architect in, uh, in Boston, um, our partners, the, the Curtis family. And uh, we started um, thinking about a wide range of uh, housing options that are needed from small units, hotel units, um, spaces for residences for students, to live uh, work spaces, studio spaces, loft spaces, and um, to high-rise structures and how uh, you know, off-site constructions are not just meant for single-family homes, but as cities really need to become denser uh, habitats, how can uh, construction methodologies help in that endeavor? So all of these types that we are, um, that we are envisioning use, again, the same technology that we are developing that is very light and easy to build um, as, uh, as it is built in a factory and taken to the site. It's very quick to assemble because of its lightness, but then can be married with uh, concrete to make it more stable, to be able to build higher. And, uh, and where, again, all the effort is placed in those initial stages of design that then will make the construction uh, happen uh, in a much more controlled and with much more quality than we see today. And, um, and of course, thinking about you know, the diversity and the flexibility of these systems to produce uh, the city. So I would just want to finish by saying that uh, today, uh, talking from an architect's point of view, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, we have the resources to build much better and much cheaper. And uh, it is going to require a lot of the stakeholders to come together and share the risk. And I'm talking, of course, about policymakers and governments. I'm talking about constructors and developers and architects and engineers and, and users. And, uh, and uh, technology can help in a way to achieve that, but there are many other factors. And, uh, and uh, we will need to be very open to testing and to experimenting a little bit, because if not, we will continue to do things as we've been doing up to now. Thank you very much.